Welcome to History in Six, a place where we sample history in six minute increments. I'm your host, T. Melindel. Today we're going to talk about the Salem Witch Trials. Time is short, let's jump into it. Our story today begins with Sir Edmund Andros. In 1674, he was sent by the Duke of York to run New York. He turned what was essentially a village into a city where they had warehouses, exchanges, regulations for commerce, forts. He set the stage for modern day New York City. In 1684, the Crown revoked the original charter of Massachusetts. In 1685, the Duke of York, yes, the same Duke who sent Sir Edmund Andrus to New York, became James II. He appointed Andros governor in 1686. His arrival in Massachusetts was not taken kindly by the locals as he was an outsider. And the fact that the king was Catholic did not help his case. King James, though, was interested in uniting all the colonies into a larger New England super colony. 1689, William of Orange was invited by Parliament to become a Protestant king. James II fled England to save his life, and the New England elite staged their own revolution of sorts. They threw Andros in prison and sent Increase Mather to England to negotiate a new charter. It was during this breakdown of authority that the witch trials occurred. Government was already in a state of suspension as the charter had been revoked. And there was great uncertainty about how, what, how government was formed, how it was being run. At the same time, there was nothing new about witchcraft in this time. In the 17th century, the devil was a center of moral theology. Fear of witchcraft was linked to being linked to the fear of the devil himself. Religious dissidents were routinely checked for marks of the devil. And hangings did happen. In Connecticut, there were 10 cases of witchcraft. On the other end of the scale, Rhode Island had zero cases. But all the rest of the colonies had occasional instances of witchcraft convictions. But 1692 was unique. It was unique for a couple of reasons. One, the scale and suddenness of the accusations. The farcical natures of the trials, as they were not serious trials. And then the severity of the punishment. The origin of this debacle began when the religious wars that raged through Europe for over a century came to a climax in the first half of the 17th century. There was a 30-year war in Central Europe between 1618 and 1648, which was one of the most destructive wars in European history. It was a battle between Catholicism and Protestantism. You know, millions died from war, disease, famine. The Holy Roman Empire was fatally weakened, ushering in a new era of smaller nation-states. The Treaty of Westphalia, which brought the war to an end, established religious tolerance in Europe. This peace of Westphalia would turn the world towards secularity. But even though the world became more secular, there were periodic convulsions of religious fanaticism. Louis XIV revoked toleration for Protestants by the Edict of Nantes in 1685, which led to the persecution of Protestants in France. Worship was banned. Churches were destroyed. People were or forced to convert or flee the country. And there was a mass exodus of Protestants from France. Titus Oates in England. He fabricated a Catholic conspiracy to assassinate Charles II in 1678. It caused a wave of anti-Catholic sentiment in England. Violent mobs went on the hunt. There was great... went on the hunt for Catholics. There was persecution and execution of innocent people. Salem hysteria fell into the similar vein. The facts of the Salem case were pretty straightforward. In early 1692, two children in the household of Samuel Paris, who was the vicar of Salem, he had his daughter Betty, nine, and his niece Abigail, eleven, began to be taken with hysterical fits, screaming and rolling on the floor. Neither girl could write, or probably couldn't read either, but they were fond of listening to the tales of Tituba, a black female slave who formed part of the household. These two girls were medically examined and clo closely questioned by their father and local busybodies. 
The girls finally name Tituba as the source of their troubles. Tituba, under pressure, confessed to witchcraft. She uh, admitted she was a servant of Satan. She spoke of cats and rats and a book of witchcraft, which was, quote unquote, signed by nine in Salem. Two names were screamed out by the girls, and as you would guess, the hunt was on. It soon attracted a great deal of interest in Salem and Boston. In mid-May, the temporary governor, William Phillips, arrived in Salem and was horrified by what he heard and set up a special court under William Stoughton to get to the bottom of the matter. This was a huge mistake. Ordinary law may or may not have worked in this case, but a special court was a disaster as it was bound to find culprits to justify its existence. And so it did. The proceedings were ridiculous. The accused who confessed were released as a reward for proving the reality of the devil's work in Salem. Those who refused to confess were found guilty and hanged. The hysteria raged throughout the New England summer. By autumn, 14 women and 5 men, all respectable people, had been hanged. One man who refused to plead at all was pressed to death with heavy stones for contempt of court. This was the only time this punishment has ever been used in America. There were over 150 people awaiting trial in overcrowded jails, and some of them died in jail. In October, people came to their quote-unquote senses when, surprisingly, unsurprisingly, prominent members of society and the governor's wife were named as potential witches. Nothing quite like pointing a finger at the leaders as witches to end the persecution. Needless to say, the special court was dissolved and those under arrest were released. The rule of law had broken down, but it was restored with promptness and penitence.
If you've enjoyed this episode, tell a friend about us. If you haven't already, subscribe to get future content. And as always, have a great day if you want to.